The next speaker is uh, Fatima Stanford Cody, uh, who's a physician in uh, obesity and nutrition, a fellow at Mass General. And, and she's going to tell you some personal narratives about caring for a number of children uh, who are overweight, who are obese. Fatima. Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Fatima Cody Stanford. I'm an obesity medicine and nutrition fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm just going to go, actually, they told me that I could only use one slide, so it looks like so there were some cheaters in the group. Um, so we're going to go to the next, um, actually, it's going backwards. Let's go for it. Got it. Fabulous. So since this is a very small screen, I'm going to mostly give you personal vignettes and talk about some of the things that have already been mentioned, but I'm going to give a different twist and maybe a concept as it relates to obesity medicine that's very different than what you have heard and what makes our program at Harvard um, novel in the way we approach obesity and obesity medicine. So people, when, they're, when I tell them I do obesity medicine, usually there are quite a few puzzled stares. What does that mean? Like what? What do I do? What is, what is that concept? Um, so at the Obesity Medicine Center at Mass General, we believe in a team-based approach to care, which was mentioned earlier, where every person that is seen and evaluated in our center over the age of 10 is evaluated by not only a physician, but also evaluated by a psychologist and a dietitian, so that we can come back, develop a team-based approach to an individual person that struggles with their weight. Many times patients come to us and they come with a weight issue. We know that this is something that is not an issue that's hidden, right? 20% of all healthcare dollars currently are spent on obesity and obesity-related issues. 20%. We can't say that about any other disease process that the human body is affected by. If you just look at my slide, I'm not going to really go into this, but you can see that obesity adversely affects every major organ system. And there is not one individual that's in this room who's a clinician who has not dealt with obesity from radiology to pediatrics to internal medicine to neurology. This is something that impacts our global field of medicine. So what are we going to do about it? What we've been doing has not been working, obviously, right? We finally have gotten 40 years of information and data. We finally are starting to level off. But if you look at the numbers, for example, more than 30% of all adults, 36% to be exact, struggle with obesity and overweight, 17% of our children, and I happen to be internal medicine and pediatrics trained. So I see these individuals coming to the center and being lost. What do I do? What do I do? When we look at obesity, obesity is really the only entity or illness process or disease, chronic disease process, where we accuse the patient of doing something wrong. So the patients come to me and they're said, you know, my doctor told me I need to lose weight. They told me I need to do this. I need to eat better. I need to exercise. I tried these things. A lot of times my patients come now, of course, I, people say I'm living the ivory tower that is Mass General. By the time I get them, they've done 20 different diets. They've done Insanity Workout Program, P90X, Slim and Six, anything else that you see on your local TVs, TV channels, and they're still struggling. I happen to be med peace trained, so I get to see families that have struggled with their weight. My youngest person is age two, and you're like, oh, what are they feeding them? But there's something in that biology. And so what I want to challenge your thinking is, is that everyone has a physiologic set point. So what does that mean? So that means that I will never be a supermodel. I will not be a size zero. I think I look great. <laughs> but there are people that strive at my gym, they come to my gym, they strive to be me, and the, the genetics of who I am is such that they won't be me. If you're six foot one, you're not going to be me and vice versa. So what is it about the bi biology? We were like, okay, well, you were probably were thinking, I know what you're thinking. The biology hasn't changed over the years. And I was an anthropology major, so I'm going to challenge that thought process. The environment in which our biology is has changed. So if we look at, and I'm going to deviate a little bit, if we look at non-human primates, for example, a gorilla will never be a chimp, will never be a lemur, will never be an orangutan. A bulldog can never be slim like a chihuahua. A poodle can never be a greyhound. 
and vice versa. So what is it about the genetics of those individual species, whether they be non-human primates, whether they be dogs, and I'm not trying to compare us to dogs, but I'm just trying to give you a concept of who we are. So when you see a patient, realize that there are things that may be outside of their control, or outside of their realm, that we need to offer solutions for. So when I see a patient come in to, to me, I get a full history. I don't just look at diet and exercise, which I think are very component, very useful components of the clinical exam and information that I need to gather. I gather information about sleep. We know that there's a, there should be a modular approach to obesity. We should look at diet. We should look at exercise. We should look at sleep. We should look at circadian rhythm and those disturbances and how they impact the person. I may have someone that has great diet, great exercise, and I get to their sleep, and I find out that they're struggling with obstructive sleep apnea. And that one component can be something that can alter their weight in the course of what that weight set point is that they've struggled with over their, the many years. I have one patient now who came to me, um, completely normal diet, as ascertained by our dietitian in their hour-long appointment with them, completely normal um, other things, but the sleep component was, was quite disturbed. And so I did a sleep test for her, which was strongly positive for severe obstructive sleep apnea. All I did was regulate that, and she has lost 60 pounds with that therapy alone. So it wasn't that she was doing those other components that we make that judgment about. It was something that we were not ascertaining within her clinical environment that we weren't doing to help her. We were using her. I see, the patient, the, I see the woman that works out in the gym next to me on the spin bike who is going three times harder than I am, and I think I'm pretty intense. And yet she's four times my size, and she says, I want to be you. But she's not me. I need to find out what that component is within her that has caused her to struggle with her weight. Was it a weight-promoting med? Most, who, who prescribes beta blockers to their patients? Beta blockers? Beta blockers is one of the most common weight-promoting meds as an antihypertensive. I have a patient that solely was normal weight, about my size, her whole adult life, went on a beta blocker and gained 60 pounds from the use of that medication. Now, she was a patient that was a little bit challenging in that she needed to be on that beta blocker, so I had to find other me mechanisms, whether it be pharmacological therapy, whether it be the use of bariatric surgery, to, to tone in on what I could do to bring her weight back to that normal set point that she had. So I'm trying to get you guys to challenge what your, what your approach is when we look at patients and patients that struggle with their weight. When a patient comes to you, try to get a whole subset of, of everything that may have had. Was there a weight-promoting med? Was there a sleep disturbance? What was it that triggered this? Was it a lifelong history that has been generational? Um, for example, if you look at African-American women, 60% of African-American women in the United States are obese. What is it about that genetic makeup that makes it so much more pronounced than the 34% of Caucasian women that struggle with their weight? There's something, and it's outside of this resting energy expenditure and all of these things that we talk about. So when a patient comes in with hypertension, we don't say, you go fix it. You go fix your hypertension and come back to me. This is what we do to patients that struggle with their weight. We have biases, we see them, we're like, they must be lazy, they must not be eating correctly. I have a patient that I happen to run into in the grocery store that I've been seeing for two years who struggles with severe obesity, and I've been telling her, you need to eat this, you need to do this. I happen to run into her in the grocery store after I've been taking care of her for two years. She's been seeing me every two months. And of course, you know, as I run into the grocery store, happen to see this patient, I survey her cart to see what is she buying. She bought every single thing that I'd ever told her to buy. Her cart was full. She had no idea I was going to be in the grocery store. I'd never seen her there. So we make these assumptions that they're not doing these things, but yet here she was with the exact same layout of my grocery cart, and I, may have, I made an, a judgment, an assumption that, you know what, she might not be doing what I'm saying. So let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. So when I think about these issues about how we look at obesity, the concept of set point, I'm not trying to get you to think of me as a biologist because I come from health policy. I did my master's in public health and worked in health policy at the CDC before going into this field. What I want to do is better inform the obesity policy that we have. Think about how environment is impacting biology and how these things are things that we need to think about as we go forth and actually set policy that makes an impact, much like the smoking cessation policies have done over the last several, 20 years, I guess, maybe more like 15. When I think about what brought me to obesity medicine, I think of two, two key stories that I want to share with you. 
Um, the first, um, I'm internal medicine and pediatrics trains I mentioned, was um, I was a resident on the pediatric service and I went in and I saw an 11-year-old girl who was asleep. Um, and as I went in to do my morning rounds and assessment, I noticed that she had these gasps and pauses in her breathing and immediately thought that there should be a concern for obstructive sleep apnea in this girl that struggled with severe, severe obesity. She was affectionately called Twinkie. That was the name that she was given. Um, so I sent her for a sleep study on discharge. I made sure that she was arranged to have a sleep study. Um, and she was scheduled to have that within two weeks, which is reasonable. She died three days later from the time of discharge. Three days later, at 11, obstructive sleep apnea that went undiagnosed, untreated. Not because I couldn't send her, because she didn't get in soon enough and no one had recognized that maybe that her idea of eating Twinkies may have been associated with something else. I was very active in the American Academy of Pediatrics and was at an obesity conference and I got a call from my mother. My mother says, your cousin has died. My cousin was 26 years old, struggled with severe obesity. And I said, Mom, what did she die from? Oh, we don't know yet. We don't know. I said, are we going to get an autopsy? We absolutely are. I said, Mom, I think she had an undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. When the report comes back and she was three months away from her wedding date, obstructive sleep apnea was what she died of. These are people dying too young. Now, those are poignant things that stick out in my mind, but those were things that made me realize that there's something that we need to do. There's something that we're not doing. People are going untreated for conditions that can have an impact on their weight, and we're not doing enough. I'm not providing that patient with enough. What am I doing wrong? So when that patient comes in and sits with me, I, yes, I evaluate, and I say, oh, yeah, maybe we can tweak your diet here. Maybe we can change this exercise here. But I know that I need to offer them solutions. I need to offer them solutions, or I am failing at my job. And I tell them that. I am failing if I'm, I am not able to help us achieve a measurable goal, a response to reduce our chronic illness and disease burden and the $147 billion every year that is spent on obesity. If you look at this graph, you see every major organ system, psychosocial, neurological, pulmonary, cardiovascular, GI, endocrine, renal, musculoskeletal, all impacted by obesity. But what are we doing? What are we doing? We need to inform this policy. We need to have those people at the table in Congress making policy that's based on science that's informing these things. I love all of the preventive things. I love Michelle Obama's Let's Move, and I'll do the Beyonce dance on the stage any day. But that's the prevention, and I think that's very important because we know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Let's prevent and where we can, but we know that we already, we just already talked about it. We already know that there's a large subset of the population struggling with obesity. What are we doing with them? I don't want to belabor the point. Thank you so much for having me here. I just want us to think about these things. If you have any questions afterwards, I'd love to talk with you. Thank you so much.